Welcome to another episode of the Above the Business Podcast. My name is Bradley Hamner, your host. On today's episode, we have Dr. Andre Laplume. He's the co-author of Spin Out Ventures and is a full professor of entrepreneurship and strategy at the Ted Rogers School of Management, which is part of the Toronto Metropolitan University. I really enjoy this conversation with uh, Dr. Laplume, where we talk about this idea of what a spin out venture is. If you don't know what this is, and even if you are a current business owner, I think there are some elements that we talk about in this conversation that can help you in your current business. Without further ado, here's my conversation with Dr. Andre Laplum. Andre, welcome to the Above the Business podcast. Thank you, Bradley. So I'm happy to be here. Excited to have you. Well, we start with background and origin story. Why don't you take uh, our listeners back, Andre, about your journey and uh, a little bit about you and how you got to where you are? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I'm not sure how far back we want to go, but uh, I, I have a background in, in computer science. That's where I started my professional career after dropping out of a very short military career. Um, I was better off, I think, uh, in the office. Uh working on analytical problem solving and things like that, helping companies often to replace people with technology, which was the very much in vogue at that time. Uh, I did that for a few years uh, pretty successfully. Um, but then I had uh, I always had this yearning to go back and, and learn more because I always felt like I was just implementing the other people's plans and I always wanted to know more about the strategic side of things. So I, I did a, an MBA, which helped me a lot to get a better, a broader understanding of how the business world works. Um, and I went back to actually some management consulting afterwards, uh, hmm. but I still, I still didn't feel fulfilled, uh, from a knowledge perspective, I guess, uh, that's one of my curiosity led me to a PhD, uh, and I did a PhD in management and while I was studying, uh, management, um, it was very much about what I saw as the most interesting part of the, the discussion about business and management was this conflict, uh, or sometimes cooperation between, the, the old companies, right? The incumbents and the, the startups or the new entrants. And I, I've always been fascinated in how some of the new entrants seem to be able to, uh, sur- you know, survive and even overcome uh, despite uh, the odds uh, against them. And so uh, a lot of my research has sort of uh, moved in the direction of trying to answer those kinds of questions or to better understand uh, that puzzle. Um yeah, and and so that has led me through an academic career. I'm, I'm a professor at a at the Ted Rogers School of um, Management, which is at the the Toronto Metropolitan University, um, and we have a, a whole bunch of uh, entrepreneurship students there and and uh, non entrepreneurship students learning about entrepreneurship. So it's a great environment for teaching, uh, and they also afford me some time to do some research. And so the 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 things we'll talk about later about the book are really driven by research that I that I've done over the years. Um, and the research of others that I've compiled into the book uh, with my co-author. You you probably wouldn't have known this, but um, this is actually great because I'm going to ask you a few questions around some maybe some of the research that you uh, specifically studied or maybe just came across. But we do twice a year, I get our members together and we do a retreat. And matter of fact, we've got one coming up in October and we call that retreat the Beat the Odds Retreat. Nice. And it came from, I don't know what the prompt was, but roughly around 2017, 2018, I started to uh, look up and I say research because when I say research versus the level of research that you do is obviously very, very different. I think mine was like Google <laughs> for 20 minutes or something. But it was interesting that... I came across and something held with me that 96%, at least in the U.S., somewhere between 91 and 96% of small businesses never see their 10th birthday. And I was like, oh my gosh, is that that real? That's unbelievable. Now, I ended up finding some more information later that after one year, 20% have failed. And after five years, 50%. And then so it just continues on. So it, it led me down this understanding that, look, starting a business is hard, okay? You know, it, it's it's not easy to get a thing off the ground. But staying in business and let alone scaling and growing a business long term is a lot harder. In some of the research that you've done, 
what are some of the things that you've came, you came across specifically around why business is just so hard? Yeah. I mean, why, why is entrepreneurship so hard? Why are startups so hard? Um, I think it's a, it's a, it's a good question. And I think that's really kind of the, the fundamental question in, in the field really of the, the kind of research that, that I do is we're trying to answer the question, you know, why do some uh, companies perform better than others, right? Or some, why do some startups succeed and others uh, don't succeed, right? That's kind of like the, the, the holy uh, grail question of the, of the field. And, you know, the, the, the early part of the, the research was mostly focused on the, the individual psychology of the entrepreneurs themselves. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of work that was done um, and still continues to be done in, in that pathway um, to try to identify this, these psychological traits that are, you know, somehow, uh, you know, embedded in, in most entrepreneurs. And so you'll hear, you'll hear people talk about things like uh, tolerance for ambiguity, or you'll hear um, people talk about uh, being able to bear uncertainty and all these kinds of traits um, that we see across uh, entrepreneurs. And so there's there's that psychological level that, that's that been studied quite a bit. But a lot of people, you know, could criticize that that approach because they say, well, you know, a lot of the, the people that we have as entrepreneurs, for example, it tends to be somewhat of a male-dominated thing in North America. Um, and if we were saying, well, the average traits of the people who are entrepreneurs are this, and then we try to to say, okay, well, does this extrapolate to to other groups as it is extrapolate to, to women, for example, and it's not so clear, right? So there's all kinds of, of issues with that. And you, if, if you add also things like different ethnic groups and, and things like that, it gets even more complex. Um, so people have started to sort of move toward looking at more structural reasons, uh, the conditions in the environment, you know, that, that uh, prevent people from becoming entrepreneurs or enable them to become entrepreneurs. And so that's why I think what we see in, you know, a lot of, a lot of cities that are, that are trying to uh, harbor entrepreneurship is, you know, they, they invest in a, in a strong entrepreneurial ecosystem, uh, which usually includes things like universities and research labs and, and incubators and accelerators and venture capital firms and angel groups and all of the different components, you know, that are, that are needed to be constructed around um, uh, a good context or environment. And then, and then once you have that in place, then, you know, there's, there's this belief that, well, you know, each place is endowed with its, its, you know, its uh, population of entrepreneurs. It's how those entrepreneurs are using their energies. Well, that's going to be different depending on the, the, you know, what they're facing. And so if you have this, this, um, proper entrepreneurial ecosystem, then you can help to channel that entrepreneurial energy toward things like startups, things like potential high growth startups or technology startups, or even social ventures and other things that can do, do good for our economies and for our societies. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. So I'm even curious on what's the, been the definition of success even to begin with. So to your point of, Hey, we're going to study these businesses were not successful. Okay. That's fairly easy. They're not in business anymore. Okay. <laughs> well, we can try to go in through and figure out what are the things that led to their demise versus what about the ones that are still in business? How do you, how, how do we even quantify that they're quote successful? What, what has been your uh, research? What has your research shown? Yeah, well, I mean, the, the, the metrics that are often used, um, when you, when you mentioned, uh, you know, the number of years or the survival rate, right. So ca calculate how long they, they survive compared to their peers. Um, that helps us to understand if a, if a startup is, is more successful, but then there are other measures such as how much, uh, how much, how quickly they grow, or how much money they raise, um, or other other types of uh, metrics that can be used. But they're all sort of imperfect uh, metrics mm -hmm. that are that are out there. Um, but there are lots of different ways to to measure uh, that performance. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, you could even just look at, you know, for one person, the entrepreneur them, themselves, they get a business to a million dollars in top line revenue, profit of 300,000. They pay themselves a salary. That is success beyond maybe their wildest dreams, potentially individually, but by some metrics and some research, you know, 
especially a business that's raising capital, a million dollars, they just like, they, they throw that around like it's nothing, right? As an example, you know, the, if you're not doing 25 million, 50 million, we're not even interested in talking to you. So it's just interesting, the definitions of success. It's not like soccer, you know, American football, basketball, where it's very clear, here's the winners, here's the losers. Business is just not, is not like that. I think that kind of speaks to, Simon Sinek's finite games and infinite games. Yeah, because I think, you know, capitalism is more like all of the games of the Olympics times 10 instead of just one sport, right? right. And so we, we do have people filling every one of these little niches and every one of those sports looks very different and attracts different types of actors and whatnot. So, yeah. Yeah, good point. So tell, tell me about the book, um, Spin Out Ventures. Tell me about kind of how the book came to be and a little bit about what what it, what it's about okay the, the book came came to be because we had published some research about uh spin outs in academic journals but we felt strongly that you know there the audience that we wanted to reach was not reading that stuff um and so we wanted to reach out to a, a more practitioner type audience um, particularly people who are uh, potential entrepreneurs people who are, who are employees who are thinking about starting their own venture Mm -hmm. but also managers who are working in, inside of organizations who have to deal with the reality of entrepreneurial employees, right? Who, who may want to leave to do uh, spin outs. So we're trying to look at, look at it from both sides um, and, and be able to tell the story of spin outs to, uh, to those two audiences. And so, you know, just as a quick definition, right? We spin out venture is a startup or, or a new business. You can think about it a new, new business or a new company, but the, the, what, what makes it distinct is that the the founders of the company, the founders of the business, um, are coming usually straight out of a, a large a large incumbent company or or a, a, a high growth startup that's doing well, and, and they jump out of there and they start their own uh, venture. And often, what they're taking, they're 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 often using a, an idea that's that they found uh, in previous employment, or sometimes they're taking knowledge or individuals or you know, like employees or resources or sometimes even customers uh, with them from the parent organization. Um, into the spin out. And so that gives them sort of an advantage, right? Because imagine you're a de novo uh, uh, founder, right? Starting a, a, a spin out, but you don't really have much experience in, in anything related. And you're really starting from scratch and you you don't know your business model and you're trying to identify your customers and figure out your, your product market fit. Meanwhile, you're competing with spin outs that have, you know, sometimes one or two or more individuals, like the, the example it's often given is the, the Zoom example with 40, 40 uh, 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 engineers that came from Cisco to to Zoom, right, along with the founder who left there. So, you know, the, you know they have a, a scale advantage in being able to grow the venture a lot faster. Um, and so uh, the studies that look at the longevity of startups and the longevity uh, and the, the, the amount that they, the, the, how fast they grow and um, how successful they become have shown that these spin-out ventures tend to be the ones that outperform. Um, and, and I think that's an important thing to know. And, and when we look out there, you know, if you can do your, your search yourself on the web or, or whatever, you can even ask one of the AIs or whatever, you ask them the question, what is a, a spin out? Um, it get, it, the, the answer is confused right now. The, the, the world thinks half the, the internet thinks that uh, it's the same thing as a corporate spin off, mm -hmm. which is not the same thing, right? Because in a corporate spin off, usually you have a company that, says, oh, we have, we have this unit and we want to, we're going to take this whole unit and we're going to take it outside and make it a, a, a separate company, um, right? That's a managerial decision. It's a corporate decision. It's not the same thing as a spin out where it's in it, the employees who are independently deciding to do this, you know, regardless of whether they have the approval of the management or not. Although sometimes they want to negotiate a deal and so they want to have that approval. So, you know, but, but most spin outs are actually totally independent. Hmm. So, you know, in my, again, I say this very tongue in cheek, but, but very light compared to what you do. When I was doing some research after looking at the failure rates of businesses in general in the U S there was a sub sub segment of that, that had a very substantially statistically very different uh, failure rate much lower, and that was franchises. I mean, I think it was around fifteen percent, and so that was very interesting to me as to why, why. Why is that? My my reason I'm giving that example is for a lot of our listeners, they may have left. 
their corporate job, or they may themselves have said, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and start my business. So they may have, in fact, a lot of our listeners already do have their business. But my question is, what are the elements that make, in addition to kind of what you've already shared, elements that make these spinouts successful that then we can apply the principles back to our business? Yeah, it's actually, it's interesting that you mentioned the, the franchises, you know, um, because, you know, when you think about the franchise model from a, a corporate perspective, right, the, the franchisor is often using the franchises to to grow quickly, right? Because they could do it and they could do it organically, right? And just own all of their own uh, expansions, right? Um, they could do it that way. But usually that that takes a lot of a lot of capital uh, to do it. And um, it can be cheaper often and, and easier to to help to have franchisees who actually bring some of their capital to it as well. And so from a, a corporate perspective, it's a it's a way to to grow the business. And and it, it also has built into it a kind of sharing of the the earnings of the business between the, the franchisee and the franchisor. Right. So it has this sort of cooperative uh, nature to it. Right. So we think about it often as a kind of strategic alliance or more than that. So it's it's a highly related concept when you think about um, spinouts, because spinouts are using, uh, you know, I, actually one thing you mentioned, you know, the um, about franchises, or I, I guess one thing that jumps to my mind right away is that often what you're getting in a franchise as a franchisee is you're getting a, a validated business model, right? That's what you're getting, because you normally as an entrepreneur you don't have a validated business model. You have to validate it, and you've got you know you've got to go and do your customer discovery and then do your product market fit and make sure that that it works. But with a franchise, what you're betting on as a as a franchisee is that you're you have a validated business model that you're implementing. Right. And so you're 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 taking that that part of the entrepreneurial process out of the equation. Right. Maybe you've done some of that in searching for the best franchise for you. OK, but but um, essentially you've taken that some of that uh, risk and uncertainty out of the equation. And the same thing with spin outs. If you think about spin outs, a lot of them, what they're doing is they're taking ideas that that their previous employer doesn't want to pursue. Right. They don't want to pursue it because for whatever reason, you know, oh, well, that's not our market or that's not big enough for us or that's not profitable enough for us or that's not the right technology for us or that's going to hurt our culture. There's a thousand different reasons that organizations have for not pursuing different ideas or different innovations that they have often themselves helped to, to incubate. Right. And so what a lot of these spin out founders are doing are they're, they're, they're basically employees who look at these opportunities and they're saying, well, these are getting shut down in this company. And I'd like to take it and bring it out and make make a startup with it. And I have better odds now because, you know, it's been it's been pre-validated. We've already looked into it, you know, as I was as a company. And uh, there's already often evidence that the innovation has has early customers or or, or other types of validation. Right. And, and so that's what gives these spin out founders an advantage. Oh, I think over over other uh, startups, right? Is that um, is that experience? Are there any disadvantages that they face compared to a traditional startup? Yeah, I mean, I, sometimes um, there can be hostility between the the spin out and the parent firm uh, that that a de novo startup would never experience because they don't, they don't have a parent. But, but that's also often depends on the way that it's done. Um, what we're seeing in the research now is a lot of cases where there's a positive relationship between the parent and the spin out because they find ways to to help each other. Sometimes, you know, the spin out becomes a customer or a, a supplier of the parent organization. There's all kinds of transactions mm -hmm. that can happen to to make things uh, more positive as well. But sometimes what happens is the 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 levers are not careful. They take uh, take things with them that uh, are sort of restricted by restrictive covenants in their in their employment contracts. So maybe they have signed a very a strict uh, non disclosure. Uh, and and one of the ideas that they want to take is a is covered under the trade secrets of the the parent organization, right? That that can that can happen. So so it, you know it behooves the the lever to be careful and make sure that they know what they've signed, uh, and when they make their decision to to do a spin out. Um, and it also sometimes that, you know, that process of looking at what the risks are helps them to understand whether they should be negotiating an exit with the, the parent company or not. Um, sometimes a license is, is appropriate. There's all kinds of different uh, possibilities, right? You know, um, <clears throat> I had an experience. There's one in particular 
I won't share the name, but they, they, they left and started their own business and they were kind of, I would say fairly vocal about things that needed to be done, um, in, in, in the business while they were an employee and, uh, they went off and started their own business. And it was a couple of years later that they came back and they said, you know, it's a lot different when you're, when you're sitting in that chair than when you're not sitting in that, in that chair. What are some of the things that, you know, in this, in this case that, um, they have some advantages, but also I'm sure you've seen examples to where people, this, I, I don't mean this is, it's not an example of grass is greener on the other side. I don't mean it that way. I just mean like, it's so easy in theory until you actually go do the thing. And then it can be like, oh, wow. Okay. Actually, this is a lot harder than what I thought it was going to be. Yeah. I mean, I think you make a good point. Uh, um, sometimes the people leaving to do a spin out are only taking part of what they need. And, and they have to cobble together the rest. And that can be very difficult or sometimes almost impossible. Um, maybe they, they, you know, they've been inside of a, the organization and they've been part of different processes, but they haven't been exposed to all of the different functions of the organization, right? So they're they're missing some of that, uh, that core business knowledge about complementary assets and how to put together an organization. And they have to figure that out um, as they go. And sometimes it's even worse, you know, depending on what you're, where the spin-out's coming from, there's often an imprint from the parent firm that isn't always a positive one. Uh, there's a big difference between a large firm and a, and a startup company. And when the, the spin out founders are taking with them uh, routines that work well for a big company, but don't work well, say for a startup, then there could be some process of unlearning that's needed in order to be a, a effective as a, as a spin out, uh, because spin out ultimately is a startup typically that, that needs to have a different cultural approach uh, than the parent firm did. Right. Yeah. So there, there are those kinds of, kinds of issues uh, at play. But I mean, comparing uh, spin out founders to to a de novo startup founders, often they have even less exposure to the real business aspects. And so um, I don't think that, that spin out founders are, are immune to these to these kinds of issues, but they, they have an advantage in, uh, inherently over the ones that uh, that have no experience or, or, you know, coming out of a student student perspective or an unemployed perspective or all, the, all these different other possibilities, right? This may not be something that's covered in, in, in your book, but I'm curious if you have some insight here is what about um, if I'm a business owner and I want to, I see an employee or two that has some entrepreneurial traits within them. And I want to, I want to cultivate that and I want to cultivate that within my organization before they go spin out to do one, right? I want to keep that innovation, that enthusiasm, that forward looking inside my organization. What are some ways for me to do that well? Yeah, I mean, sometimes that's the the, the toughest challenge because if you have, you know, entrepreneurial employees, they can do great things internally, but they could also just turn around and go and do it, uh, do it on their own. And so I think that's a pretty common challenge is to try to figure out, well, how do we keep them, working for us um, and lots of different approaches have been used such as compensation for one and tying it to uh, shares in the company and providing stock options and these kinds of approaches and saying, well, you're kind of tied here now. You, you want your shares to best, don't you? Um, but, but, you know, the research shows that that's a kind of like a double-edged sword because, you know, once they, they do vest, then they have that uh, liquidity and pot of money that they can use uh, for their venture. So uh, other than like compensation type approaches, and we've talked about the restrictive covenant type approaches, the legal means, but those tend to sort of stifle people and uh, kind of make them feel like they're not not in a really entrepreneurial kind of situation. Um, and so, you know, there are other approaches that can be used as well. And sometimes we call it strategic intent. And so the idea is to try to channel the energy of those entrepreneurial employees toward projects that are more related to the core, or what the, 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 the top management team perceives to be the core, the core business activities uh, of the organization. And so it's more likely that those things will stay uh, in internally uh, and maybe have some in that strategic intent, some resistance to the pursuit of, of internal corporate ventures that might be too far off and, and, and going into more diversified markets or diversified 
product lines or things that might be more suitably disconnected from the from the parent organization later, right? As we know, you know, we know from a lot of research about big corporations that when they focus, they tend to do a lot better than when they try to be in mm. 10 different businesses at the same time that they don't really know much about, right, uh, anymore. So, um, yeah. Mm, that's good. Andre, where would people, you point people to pick up the book and also to be able to connect with you? I mean, yeah, of course we want, we would love people to pick up the book. Uh, um, this is what it looks like. Uh, it's available on Amazon and just about everywhere else um, that you can buy books these days. Um, and um, I'm happy to connect with people on LinkedIn, you know, uh, just uh, Google my name and I mean, uh, LinkedIn search my name and I'm sure I'll be the first one to pop up with uh, Andre Leplum. So um, yeah. Last question. What do you think, what do you think being or working at times above the business, what does that mean? How does that resonate with you? Yeah, you know, it's interesting because I, I was I was thinking about that because you kind of mentioned it uh, earlier that you're going to ask me this question. And um, it resonates well, actually, with this concept of spin outs and, and really what you think about what an organization is and what a business is. And I think sometimes as an employee, you know, I remember a time when as an employee of a, of a, of a company, I'm thinking to myself, oh, I'm, I'm a, you know, I'm a member of this organization. I'm a part of this. I identify with it. It's like, it's, it's, it's successes and it, are my successes and its failures are, are, are my, my failures. But I think sometimes we get, we get a little bit too, um, I guess, connected or, or uh, too close to the, the concept of a, of a unit or an organization. Um, when really, when, when you're thinking about business, when you're thinking about entrepreneurship, um, often the, the, there's a disconnect between organizations and businesses, right? Sometimes businesses don't belong in certain organizations, right? Or they need new organizations. And I think when we start to think about them that way, as this kind of disconnect between businesses and organizations, then we can think more fluidly about our careers too, in terms of being, you know, internal to one company or whether we need to change companies or start a new company, right? Um, and, and so I think when I think about above the business, that's, that, that's what it makes me think about. I love that. That's great. Well, you know, a couple of my takeaways, uh, really from today, it's a good reminder of just really what, the, what is my definition, my own definition of success that has really just, as we've been talking, has been my own, the back of my mind of exactly what is my own definition, not anybody else's, not academic, just really my own definition of success in business. And it made me think about the psychological traits that you mentioned and the structural traits. And then I even was going back and thinking through when I was in corporate America, uh, I was uh, previously, I mean, this is years ago now, I, I was that entrepreneur that had some ideas of things that could be done. And I, I would have been, I really feel like that there were some traits and I did not have the word entrepreneur in me. That wasn't part of my vernacular at the time. But there were these elements of some committees that I, were, I was on, um, et cetera, that made me realize like I would have been a prime candidate for uh, some sort of a, a spin out at some point. I would have said, hey, you know what? We're just not, they're not going to do, they're moving too slow. They're not taking their ideas seriously. Saranara, you guys come with me. Like that would have been totally me to do that. So Dr. Andre Leplum, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thank you, Bradley, for having me. It was a good time. Shout out to our podcast sponsors, Autopilot Recruiting, Cooch B Consulting, Club Capital, and Today App Pro. I was uh, having a conversation with someone who is uh, starting a tech company. It's actually going to be a software company. He's, he's started several, actually. And he was just talking about the challenges of creating a product that actually not only has product market fit, but people really enjoy using. Well, that is what Today App Pro has done. Go to todayapppro.com, todayapppro.com. Get away from the Excel spreadsheets and the manual whiteboards. Those are great in their places, but it's not going to be the place that has your bonus, your compensation plans, your word tracks, all in one. Todayapppro.com. We were just talking to our members about the importance of having a bench and once they, you then bring people on, how do you continue to develop them? Look, at the end of the day, we'll look, look at Coach P and what he does to help you develop your team and develop yourself. 
as well as with autopilot recruiting to help you to have that bench. We just had two of our members um, at Blueprint OS who had some turnover, but both of them had a bench. And I asked them just today, how did that impact the fact that you had a bench and how you would approach it if you didn't? They said, I would have been stressed out of my mind. Autopilot recruiting can help you to have a bench so you're ready if and when that time comes, whether it's voluntary or an involuntary turnover, autopilotrecruiting.com. Of course, you got to continue to develop them. That's where Coach P can help. Go to coachpconsulting.com. You know, just like with recruiting and developing, leading your team, there's so many different hats to wear in the organization. You don't have to become a CFO, but you do need to know and have an understanding of the financial statements to be able to read those and then to be able to make better decisions in your business. Should you invest in this marketing program? Should you invest in this person? Do you have you know, um, the, the cash to make this investment in this team member? How long will it take you to get a return on investment from that team member? Club Capital can help you with all of that. Go to club.com capital. Hey, everyone, if you like some of the things that I share, go to blueprintos.com forward slash assets. We've got a number of tools on there. And I even do a web class almost every week that you can pop on to. Love to connect with you on there. Blueprintos.com forward slash assets. All right, everyone. Till next episode, lead well.